Are you alive today? All right. Uh, Psalm 150. Did I tell you to go there? No? Okay. We're going to begin there, uh, even though we're not going to end there. Psalm 150. An open heaven, in order for an open heaven to be sustained, one of the things that you will see evident, at least I'm seeing so far, is that our prayers will begin to turn more into praise. At some point, prayer must shift into praise. Are you with me so far? And so one thing that I've seen God shift is that, you know, two hours a day I'm, I'm, I'm in the park praying. But now I'm two hours in the park praising. And I've noticed that, that the prayers are, are just falling off. God, I'm not going to pray about that. You already know the need. And what's triggered is, God, I'm thanking you for it. Even if I don't see it manifest right now, God, I'm giving you praise for it. Amen. When it gets to the point where God says, son, stop believing and start seizing, we got to listen. Amen. And so I, I, before I get in this, this message this morning, I want to talk to you, uh, give you some things to think about before we gear up and, and are ready to go, because some things you really, really got to capture. Praise has purpose. I couldn't believe that she said that this morning because I wrote it down here three hours ago, four hours ago, right here in red. You can see it. Praise has purpose. Now, praise has purpose for us as a body when we come in here, right? There's a, there's a, there's a heart for God to say, look, I, I'm desiring your praise. But guess what? Praise has purpose in you individually. Every single one of us, you have a purpose, an assignment that God has given you to bring forth praise. Did you know that trees outside has that same assignment? To usher outward the praises of God. He said, everything that hath breath, including the animal kingdom. <laughs> Now, now I, I'm not around a farm here anymore, but years ago, when we lived up in Illinois, you'd, you'd be driving by and you hear all these crazy noises these animals making. Makes you wonder if they weren't in a praise service. <laughs> all right, so we're going to begin in Psalm 150. And there's a very familiar scripture that you know in Psalm 22. And it says, God inhabits the praises of his people. Is that not what it says? You know that word inhabit? means to possess. It means to consume. But listen to this. It means to have a home among the living. It means to take up residence in the midst thereof. So what God was saying, look, when you praise me, I'm moving in and the devil's moving out. When you praise me, God's saying, I will move in and sickness will move out. When you praise me, every worry, every concern, every, every, every fear that you have moves out because I'm moving in. God is fat. He's obese. And when his, now listen, I'm going to explain this. When he comes in to an atmosphere, he swells up his presence so there's not one crack of anything demonic that can survive. That's why I said, I look, when I move in, I'm not sharing my abode with anything grieving. I'm not going to share, I'll take the upstairs and the devil take the downstairs. God didn't say that. When, I, when you praise me, you're asking to be possessed. And your world will get possessed. It's like, God, I wanted you in my house, not in the garage. He'll take the garage too. He'll even possess your dreams. He'll possess your thoughts. He will possess your tomorrow. Because everything about you, God says, mm, when you praise me, I take ownership. I'm coming in and I'm bringing heaven with me. And, we, and you will taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. I will, I will come in and when you get up every morning, I've got breakfast served. It's called a plate of mercy and grace. No more trips to the hospitals when I'm in the house. Come on, somebody. No more lack. No more poverty when I'm in your midst. Because I can just right now release a treasure from the vault of heaven and take care of that. And at the same time, pay everybody's house payment down the street. In his presence is the fullness, you see. 
And if you want the fullness of God in your life, get addicted to praising him. Amen. All right. That was my opening. That was my introduction. Here's what it says. Psalm 150 is commonly known as the chapter of praise, right? Verse 1, are you there? Did I tell you Psalm 150, right? Okay. Psalm 150. It said, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. <laughs> Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. He don't want lashing or lousy. He just wants the clashing too. Amen. And then it says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Incidentally, 12 mysteries wrapped up in that one psalm right there. 12 times God gives the command to praise. 12 is incidentally is the number for government or the number of the kingdom. Now, let me tell you something. If you have a famine of praise in here, you will live in a famine out here. You understand? If there is a famine of praise inside, you will, you will live in a famine of God's blessing on the outside. God will bless you when you praise, and then he'll pour out of you and continually pour out until everyone around you says, Ooh, you're blessed. I can see the blessings of God in your life. Amen. Praise is a big deal in heaven. Tell the person next to you, praise is a big deal in heaven. And nudge him, you got your praise on today. Praise is a garment. Amen. God is looking for praise upon the earth. Now, praise is thanksgiving wrapped around a testimony. If God does something in your life, it will merit praise. And when you begin to thank him, it will sing a song of praise around whatever that testimony is. Amen. Praise is not only a priceless commodity in heaven, but it is a priceless commodity in the kingdom. Why? Because it ensures a continuation of the blessings and goodness of God. If praise was to ever cease, God would cease. Think of that for a second. If praise was to ever stop, God would stop. If God was to have a heartbeat, it would cease, it would stop. He would go into a cardiac arrest if praise was to ever stop. But since God is looking for praise, there's something wonderful. If God can't find praise, he'll praise himself. That's why it's everlasting. To, see, praise is everlasting. Praise will never cease. Prayers will cease. Because when you arrive in heaven, you have no longer need of anything. So you won't ask God for nothing. Where praise will cease, or excuse me, where prayers will cease, pray, praising God will never cease. It is everlasting to everlasting. Something pretty important, obviously, right? There is no ending to praise. Why? Because God's goodness is everlasting and everlasting. God is looking for praisers on the planet. And if he can't find any, he said, I'll take, I'll turn my church. If I can't find praise in my church, then I'll turn my church into a rock quarry. And I'll show up and I'll stand before the rocks and the rocks will cry out if I can't find someone to praise me. That's how important praise is. God said, if I can't find praise, I'll summon a song to come from the rocks and the rocks will cry out. Hallelujah. <laughs> See, praise is a struggle for outer court Christians. 
And it's an out, it's a struggle because they, 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 they exist on the outer fringes without any, look, you can exist on the outer courts without ever having any passion for God. It, you can you can exist in the outer courts being lukewarm. An outer court camp camping out at the inner or the outer court. Chances are you will miss what God is doing, providing that you that you that it, look. If you're comfortable living in the outer court, I'm just going to give you two things to think about. Number one, you're digging in a well that will never produce water. And two, you're living in a place that in book of Revelation chapter 11 says, I'll wipe it away. There will be no outer court in Revelation. God, look, you know, if you ever read that's in Revelation chapter 11, they went, John went to measure the tabernacle. God said, don't measure the outer court because it's about to be wiped out. So you, really for those that are want to live in the outer court, they're living in a temporary abode because they come in the future. There'll be no more outer court to dwell in. God will shave it right off. Why? Because praise is what takes us in. <sighs> Many believers today are struggling because they're living in the outer court. Now, here's something I'm going to challenge you with. Jesus confronted it in Matthew chapter 23. If you ever read the book of Matthew chapter 23, there's a chapter, that particular chapter there is commonly known as the eight woes of religion. I preached that one time in a tent revival, stirred up more pastors than anybody I've ever seen in my life. My God, I had to almost be ran out of town and provoked people. But Jesus brought a message in 23 and he started rebuking the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And in verse 13, he makes one statement. He said, you don't want anything to do with the inner place. So what you do is you barricade the door shut and you won't let anybody else in. He said, you won't go into the presence of God on your own and you don't want to be upstaged by the peers that you lead. So you'll board it up and tell, no, 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 we can't enter in. And Jesus rebuked them. And he used that word, you shut up heaven. You know that word shut up means? It means to place a barricade ceiling so that the rain of heaven won't touch the earth. Now think of this for a second. Now, we, we, now listen, when you have an outer court mentality, you want to be seen as being a believer, but you don't want to believe. You want to stand as one pious that would have faith, but you have no faith, see, in that mentality. And it's funny that he tagged the leadership because really one of the biggest deterrents to an open heaven is this right here. Leadership that don't want to go in. And because they don't want to be outdone by the people they lead, here's what they do. I'm going to stand right in front and barricade this thing. You don't want to go in. How does, how does one shut up the things of God from a, from a population of believers? You know what they do? They discredit it. Oh, you don't want to go in there. Those are fanatics. Could be that they just have faith. You don't want to go in there. They're zealots. Could be that they're just hungry. Amen. And that mentality, see, is in opposition to praise. Oh, no, 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 let me get wrong. We'll sing songs in the outer court. But it won't take us to the inner place. Let's see. Are you here? Sadly, a majority of believers today can't function in the inner court because they're afraid to go into the unknown. It, see, some of them, see, look, wh what happens when you're a baby and you lose your appetite? It's the first thing that, that parents do, freak out, something wrong with the body, something wrong, there's sickness somewhere. When we start, when we stop hungering for God, it's because sickness is here. Sickness has entered in somewhere. When, when, when our lives stop at the progression at the outer court and say we don't want any more of God, sickness has entered in somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? There will come a time when God will begin chopping away at the outer court. Are we going to wait for the last day when there's no place to live then? Or are we going to run to the inner court? Amen. When God, listen, when God 
commanded Moses to build the tabernacle, what's the first thing that he built? The outer court? Nope. The first priority of the tabernacle, in God's eyes, was the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the holy place. See, God has an eye. The, the, the method of God's building is dealing with the inside first. Then we work towards the outside. The ark was the very first thing God said, I've, in order to change Israel, I've got to get to its very heartbeat. I've got to get to the very depth, the deep place that Israel don't want me to go. Because when I get here, I can sever the life of darkness and get set in motion so that now outwardly they can begin living. We got it backwards. We think we need to build the tabernacle from the outside in. Don't work that way, beloved. God builds from the inside out. Amen. And it starts with the Ark of the Covenant. Glory to God. Can I keep going? The outer court, I'm going to say it another way. The outer court are the outer waters. They're the shallow waters. The holy place represents the deep of God. Some believers don't want the deep things of God. They, they, they want their feet on, on steady sand in the shallow water so they won't drown. Sometimes it's good to drown in the deep of God. Amen. Here's another thing that the outer court represents. Here's a terminology I'll give you. It means my flesh has prevailed. The outer court means I've wrestled with God. He tried to bring me in. I tried to stay out and I prevailed. Outer court means my flesh prevails. Some people won't move in because it costs something. Some people don't like venturing in the unknown because they don't know what's going to happen. Well, am I going to have to give something up? Am I going to have to lay something down? Am I going to have to live a certain way? Am I going to have to carry my character a certain way? But look, look, if, if we are ever concerned that we're going to be led to a place of where our character can't sustain us, then we're not trusting God enough. Because if God shaves us as he's taken us to the holy place, obviously he saw something in us that he loves. Something that is wonderful that he says, yeah, if I can cut the flesh out of you and bring you into the place of where you're pure, ah, I'll, I'll, I'll dwell with you, I'll fellowship with you, we'll, we'll have a time of intimacy, and I'll give you my heart's desire. And, and simply, we just got to understand that as God brings us in that progression from the outer to the inner, he's just shaving things off, it's okay. Amen. Because some of us are, are have, have, you know, we, we carry, and that's one thing that God has been showing me is that, look, I've had to, and I say this before, that there's pieces over me all over that park. God just, shoo, can't have it. You're hungering for me? Great. I want you hungering for me, son. But the more you come into my presence, the less of you, the less of the stinky you can come. So if you keep hungering and keep allowing me to change, God said, I'll just shave that. And it's getting easier. I've always said that, that when you know you're in the refiner's fire, you'll beg God, Lord, never let me out of the refiner's fire. I Like one preacher said, the moment I step out of the refiner's fire, sin is near. Amen. Good stuff. Hallelujah. All right. Now that you have some foundation of praise, some thoughts to think about, now I'm going to give you my message. I'm going to give you some nuggets about praise, what praise does, right? Praise, number one, <laughs> I love this. Praise breaks through the sound barrier. If we have a mindset that, look, if we have defined, and I hope nobody in this house defines praise this way, if we have defined praise as singing a few songs and clapping our hands and moving our bodies on a Sunday morning service, then we have missed what praise is. And if, you, and if you've been under that mindset, I, I pray right now that God brings much correction and teaching so that you understand what real praise is. All right, Because that is so not what praise is. All right, Listen to this. Praise breaks the sound barrier. Acts 16, verse 25, wonderful story. In verse 25, it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, everybody say suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. 
And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. Now look, I can, I can, in the natural, I can see an earthquake breaking loose hinges off a door, but I can't see in the, an earthquake causing the shackles to be unlocked and dropped to the ground. At some point, we got to let go of, of, of the fanciful, mental, natural mentality and, and look at what the spiritual application is. And that was a supernatural encounter. Their praise surpassed the sound barrier, and it brought a shaking into this world. When you, have you ever seen a jet airplane, a military jet plane, crash through the sound barrier? Go and look on YouTube and, and look at what the fighter jets, when they breach that sound barrier, what you see on camera. What happens is, is that the sound, they hit such a speed where that, that, that speed itself becomes now a powerful force. And you literally see on camera where the, the atmosphere looks like a rolling portal around the plane that literally begins to unravel. And you'll see them enter into one new dimension when they crash through that sound barrier. I'm telling you, there, there's videos of, of, of F-16s passing through um, uh, aircraft carriers and the soldiers are, vi and they, they crash through that, that sound barrier. And then after it crashes through, it just shakes everything. But it's not just hitting a high speed. When they hit that barrier, you'll see it on camera where it looks like a door in the sky opens up and they literally pass through. That's what your praise does, beloved. Paul and Silas, they praised until it broke through the sound barrier. And when it broke through the sound barrier, the only thing that now was left between heaven and earth was an open space. It became a portal. And as, and as much as they praised God, everything began to shake on the earth. And God shook the shackles right off of them. Everyone, even the jailers that probably weren't even believers, witnessed what happened. If the church today, in a, in a, that's just two men. Imagine what a church would do today if they would, if they would just let go of the just songs and, 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 the, and the stuff that we have today as our definition of praise. And if they were to really, truly enter into the praises of God in one church building with one group of God's people, uh, praising like Paul and Silas, they could imagine what God would do to the city of Houston. On a 1035 or 1045 morning on a Sunday, there would be an earthquake in this city. Just one church. If just one church was to praise him like they praised him, God would do in Houston like he did there. Just one. Just one time. It created a sonic boom. Last week, I was, I was in Damascus Road walking and praying, and I, I thought, God, here's been my prayer. I said, God, I want to learn how to praise here like they praise in heaven. I, more than that, I want to learn how to live here like they live in heaven. If I'm going to spend eternity there, I want to learn right now how to live there. So that's been my heart. I've been crying out to God for that. Here's what God showed me one day. I'm walking, and my praise changed. I, I, I shut the, 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 pulled the headphones out. I thought, God, I don't need music right now. And my heart beat began to praise, not my tongue, not my mental idea of what praise should be. And I said, God, I don't know how to praise you. That's what came out of my mouth. I'm only going to praise you what my heart knows. And man, something triggered. God said, mm, I'll take that right there. And immediately God took me into this place where I began to see heaven erupt in praise. Now listen to this. I'm walking in this realm which looked like, like the saints of God everywhere, mingled in with angels everywhere. And there was like silence for a moment. And then somebody, not, not God, somebody in, in this heavenly realm would just throw out a, 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 a attribute of God. And he would just like, God is our healer, is his example. And all of a sudden, heaven erupted and it would shake. And then another moment of silence. And then someone in the distance would yell something out. And then all of heaven would shake. And then when I came out, I said, God, what in the world did I see that for? And God said, see, that's what praise is. When, when there is a heart of real affection now, praising God, he said, it just causes me to shake. And when I shake, heaven shakes with me. And he said, son, if you'll learn how to praise like that, I'll, pr I'll shake here how I shake there. I thought, oh, Father. And my praise has turned. My praise has, has shifted in that. It's like, God, give me a sonic boom. 
I, look, I don't care if I'm in a parking lot. I don't care if I'm in the woods, out in the middle of nowhere. I don't care if I'm at, I'm at home. I don't care if it all one of your house is hanging out. God, I want my praise to create a sonic boom where everything just shakes. Glory to God. <laughs> mm. See, here's the thing. I, I said, God, and then the reason why I turned my music off, God said, I don't need your lip singing. Here's our interpretation of praise today. Our praise, God said, when you when the church gets past the karaoke praise. When we learn to get past our karaoke praise, start lip singing to a fashionable song of the week, and we call that praise. That's not the praise that Paul and Silas had. Look, when you when you get into a place like that where you don't have a stereo to call upon. You don't have an iPad to use or a, or a, or a phone to use, man. You're in, you're in the middle of somewhere where the, you don't even get a sound. God says, I've given you sound already. Hallelujah. You carry a song already. And if you don't carry a song, you carry a testimony, surely. And when that comes to release out of your heart, look, you can, you can sing your salvation. You can sing your healing. And you don't even have to sing. Praising is not just singing. It is declaring the goodness of God. The goodness of what he's done, wrapping around your testimony, and it's declaring the goodness of what he's doing right now. If you don't have, look, I'll say it this way. Look, if you don't have any goodness right now, my God, take a step back and start praising God for something that he did yesterday. And it just might, God it may stir God up enough to do something in your midst right now. That's that's that right there is it is no excuse to be lukewarm. If you don't have if you if it look if God was to say what am I doing today in your midst? And you said nothing. Go back to yesterday. Go back to a promise in the word. Go back to some moment in your life where God touched you and you saw the goodness of God and declare praise over that. And God says, "Ah, that'll cause me to shake and I'll set something in motion for you to praise me tomorrow with." God says he loves praise. And if he can't find it on the planet, he'll summon a congregation of rocks. And he'll tune his ear into a stone if they'll praise him. And look, if the rocks are having a bad day, guess what? God will step back in eternity and say, I don't need a praise from a created being. I can praise myself because I'm Elohim. I'm impressed with myself because there is no beginning before me and there is no after after me. He said, I am the everlasting, the everlasting. And because I am, I can praise myself. Hallelujah to God. Now, it's easy to get arrogant and say he needs his praise. No, he doesn't need your praise. He just enjoys your praise. But mark my words, if you give up your praise, God will bring an orchestra of angels around you, and the angels will begin dancing all over your dead, rebellious shoes. Glory to God. And they will usher in a hallelujah time in his presence. A dead shoe is one that's not on fire for God. Sometimes people are afraid to praise him because they, they might start dancing. I don't want to I don't want to embarrass myself in public. Would you rather shame God? Come on now. Praise, he said. He inhabits. <laughs> Glory to God. So we got to get past our get past our links our link sinking our lip syncing praise. I'll get there. I'll get it there. I promise. And we got to enter into the praise that, and she read it this morning, is a sacrifice. Hebrews 11 or 13, 15 said, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the sacrifice of praise? Is it taking a stone or taking a piece of wood and burning it and tossing it on the fire? No. Is it slaughtering an animal, tossing them on the fire? No. What does it mean when he says, offer me up a sacrifice of praise? What he's saying is that, look, look, take your praise and take it beyond your comfort level. When you give me praise, don't just give me some lip service. 
Anybody can do that. I want you to go beyond what is comfortable for you. I want you to enter into the holy place with me. And let me tell you something. You know what it's like to praise him in the outer court. Try praising him in the holy place and see how long, glory to God, you stand on your feet. He will kiss you with his goodness. Oh, glory to God. You will find yourself in that intimate place with him. And he'll grab a hold of you and say, ah, oh, my beloved, I'm not letting you go. You took your praise to me beyond what was comfortable for you. Ah, uh, now you're in my holy place. You're under my pavilion. Hallelujah. You've, you, you, have, you have voiced out a love language of mine. I, I'm totally convinced that the goodness of God should, you know, I thank you, Lord, for that little bitty blessing. I think in the goodness of God is, good God, I can't handle all this blessing. There's no little trickles. It's like we we expect God who is in recession to give us the little trickle down kingdom economics. It don't happen that way, beloved. Look, when God shows up, he said, I am extravagant. Have you ever, (laughs) am I okay to say that? Thank you, Lord. Have you ever had a a relative come and stay a weekend and they bring enough, they bring enough suitcases like it's a trip that lasts six months? It's like, what are they moving in? (laughs) Bless them. See, when God shows up, he brings heaven with him. You find yourself having your home remodeled, rooms enlarged. He'll get in the garage, throw out all your junk so he can store treasures for you. And when he comes in, he comes in extravagantly. I don't want to heal just your little eyebrow. I want to heal your whole family. I don't want to touch you just for today. I want to touch your whole life in my goodness. And some people just say, Lord, I just would rather have a trickle. Because there's other things in life to enjoy besides your goodness. Yeah, we keep believing that. We'll find out real soon. There's no goodness except the goodness of God. Amen. I don't want to get to heaven and say, you mean, you mean to tell me I could have lived 65 years in the glory? You mean to tell me I cried myself to sleep because I was so miserable? You mean to tell me I could have been free? I could have enjoyed the abundant goodness of God? What a horrible thing to, man, I, look, to know that we would waste life here on this planet for as long as we've got. To only find out in God, look, dummy, I would have gave you the world if you would have just praised me. I never created the long, miserable face. I never gave you that hardship. You brought it upon yourself. Or worse, the enemy did it to you. But you should you didn't have to keep it. And to think... That I, I got to be in a, now listen, we will not enter into heaven in a wheelchair. Because where's he going to put the wheelchairs? You're not going to be crutched in. Where's he going to put the crutches? You will not even enter into that world band-aided because of all the sin and the wounds. No. You will be found without spot or wrinkle. You're not going to need that wheelchair when you cross in. Amen. Amen. And if he's the same yesterday and and forever, and that's the forever, what about today? Do you need the wheelchair today, figuratively speaking? See what I'm saying? (sighs) Are you alive? Alive. Tell the person next to you, it's time to offer him a sacrifice of praise. Now, do me a favor. I want you to pinch the person. You got to pinch them. Pinch the person next to you. Say, now get out of your comfort zone and really start praising God. And then I want you to tell them, look, I can't pull you out of your comfort zone, but the Holy Ghost is on his way. Glory to God. (laughs) I'm getting so blessed up in this house, I can't hardly stand it. Hallelujah. Did you know that your praise shatters the enemy? He he gets all big and bad with himself until you start praising. He goes, ooh. Your praise reduces him down to below your feet. That's pretty small. (laughs) The atmosphere that is filled with praise, and I'm not talking about a church. I'm talking about you, me, this atmosphere right here, this temple right here, this tabernacle. 
when it's filled with praise, sends the enemy running. He'll run from us. Demons will flee. Sickness will disappear. Poverty will go away. Confusion will no longer have a hold of your mind. The devil fears the power that praise releases. Now look, if praise was an energy force, it could be used for anything. But I'm going I'm to give you an understanding of what praise is. Praise, real praise, releases the power that declares what Jesus has done. We don't praise the Holy Spirit. We don't praise a doctrine. That would be idolatry. Praise, if it's correct, will foster a heartbeat for Jesus. Every, he will get all the glory, the Bible says. That's the healthy form of praise. Anything outside of that is idolatry. And the wonderful thing is, is that when we are found to be a praising people, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 22, it says, when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, guess what I did? This is what God says. I set an ambush against your enemy. Amen. Look, the devil has already got ambushes set against you and I. He's already got assignments hatched out. He has already got a plan to, to, to mess you up, trip you up, discredit you, hurt you, harm you, wound you, get you discouraged, get you full of fear, get you sick, get you bound, get you in disunity. Some people are disunified with themselves. You can't even find divinity. Oh, come on now. Some people are so divided, they can't even, their flesh can't even agree with their mind. And their mind can't even agree with their heart. And they sit there, should I do that? Should I do that? Can I do that? Can I do that? That's division. You, you need unity in, your, in yourself. But he will try to get you dislodged from unity. He'll try to get you discouraged. He'll try to get you angry and full of rage. Those are assignments that he has already hatched towards us. But God's saying, look, you don't have to go through those, those entanglements. You don't, have to be a, a, you don't even have to be afflicted by those assignments. If you will put praise in your heart, he said, I will set an ambush against those devils. And you'll just truck along on the road, and all of a sudden you'll see an ambush on fire. And that was a devil that had already set out to destroy you that God just reached down and woof with the glory of God. And, then, and not only that, the ambush caused devils to turn on themselves. They couldn't even stand together. God said, I'm going to have them turn on each other. They will devour each other. That's an ambush of God. And in the natural, Israel could not have taken out that enemy. God said, look, they outnumber you. And to be frank, they're more armed than you are. But you got a weapon that's flight years in advance of what that devil's got for you. It's called praise. Now you get out on the battlefield and you sing praise before they, before they draw their first weapon. He said, I will set fire. I will set an ambush to the camp of the enemy. And he said, you're not even going to have to stand there and fight. You won't even have to draw the sword because you're going to watch your enemy draw the sword on themselves. He set an ambush against the enemy of God. When you and I praise God, he sets an ambush against your enemy. Amen. <laughs> Woo, glory to God. Now let me give you number two. Real praise does not include any dead hallelujahs. And we sure try to offer some up. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I can barely get myself out of bed and face the sunlight today. I need to sit down because, oh, God, there's just so much oppression around me. I don't have the strength to even say the name of Jesus. My family's all messed up. I lost my job, or if I have my job, they're fighting against me. Ain't got no money to even pay attention. Sick as sickness can get. Prayed, never see anything happen. Read, never see anything happen. But God, I'm going to offer you a hallelujah. (laughs) 
Revival? Mm, what's that, Lord? Resurrection? Well, I don't know. That tomb sealed up in my life pretty good. I know you hung up on the cross. For I know that, Lord. I'm not dumb. I read it in the scripture that you hung up on the cross for me. And Lord, I know the troubles that I've been in. But boy, God, I just think it's just way too much. I know there's other people in life that have got it worse than I do, Lord. And I know these promises that you've given, but man, I just don't know, God. I'm not calling you a liar or anything. I mean, they, you know, hear my heart out. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not foolish enough to call you a liar. Lord, you just don't know the trouble that I feel. I just don't think I can make it to church. I just don't think I can make it. I don't, I, Lord, I don't have the strength to open up the pages of the word. I don't have enough strength to reach over and push play on my CD player. <laughs> Lord, it hurts when I smile. Lord, you just don't know the trouble. Two devils didn't attack me. All of hell jumped on my back. My car won't start. The AC went out. Lord, I just don't think that I can praise you today. So, Lord, I see all those assignments of the enemy. And that's why I'm not going to leave the house. I'm going to hide myself underneath my sheets. And I'm going to grab my security blanket, which is my past. And I'm going to hold on it for dear life. And, Lord, if you can just come out to the outer courts and brush by, maybe I'll grab on the fringes of your garment. And the bleeding will stop. But God said, if you will praise me, I will set ablaze every little camp that the enemy has fashioned together against you. So that no weapon that they've put together, that they've created and, and, and actually aimed at you will find a target. Isaiah chapter 38, I love this story. There was a man by the name of Hezekiah, right? King Hezekiah. And he was dying. He was, he was sick. He was diseased. And he, he, had, he had met his end of days. Now listen to what happens in verse 10 in, in Isaiah 38. It says, I said, in the prime of my life must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years. This was the prayer coming out of Hezekiah's mouth. And I said, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. What a horrible, horrible statement. No longer will I live on my fellow man or look on my fellow man or be with those who dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been called or pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I've rolled up my life and he has cut me off from the loom day and night. And you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion, he broke all my bones. Day and night, you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush, and I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens, and I'm being threatened. Lord, come to my aid. And then he says, but what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. Therefore, I walk humbly all my years because of the anguish of my soul. Lord, by such things people live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. Really. In your love you kept me from the pit of destruction, and you have put all my sins behind your back. 
Now I'm going to stop right there. Hezekiah was a king that got sick and was facing his last days of breath. He was so important that he sent a heavyweight prophet by the name of Isaiah to his bed. And and Isaiah prophesied over Hezekiah and he said, Man of God, king, set your house in order because you're about to take your last breath on this planet. So now Hezekiah was facing a prophetic word from a heavyweight prophet that was pretty, pretty accurate, telling him, look, you're going to die. Set your house in order. You know how many people get told that every day by doctors? Set your house in order. It's terminal. There's nothing we can do for you. And they say the same thing that Hezekiah said. Lord, this is my end. So the Bible says, it goes on to say that after Isaiah prophesied and told him, set your house in order, Isaiah's walking out of the courts. Hezekiah rolls out of bed, and the Bible says he puts his face against the wall, and he starts declaring to God. And and the Bible says he pulled up his record, and Isaiah kept on walking. And he pulled up his history in God, and Isaiah kept on walking. And he pulled up all the things that he did as king, and Isaiah kept on walking. But then Hezekiah said one statement. He said, God, if I die, how can the grave praise you? He said, God, the the grave can't praise you. And Isaiah stopped in his tracks. In the midst of dying, in the midst of a prophetic word, Hezekiah makes a statement that stops the prophet of God. And God says, prophet, go back and tell Hezekiah that if he's willing to praise me, I will bring him out of the grave and add 15 years to his life. Are you getting this? He stopped a prophetic word. He stopped the the reality of, of the fact that God was about to take him home. But he said, God, how can I praise you if I'm in the grave? And God said, oh, wait a minute. Hold up here. Uh, He made a statement that is worth more than death. He just caught the revelation. Ah, and Isaiah makes a statement. He said, yeah, now you understand that the praise, hallelujah, that we offer to God is for the living, not the dead. Look, when we offer up praise to God, God said, I hear your praise. I'll even take myself to jail and I'll stand in the midst of jail along with my people. Hallelujah. And the Bible says that Paul and Silas begin to praise and suddenly at the midnight hour, God just got all happy with himself and shook the earth and shook them right out of jail, shook them right out of bondage. God will get so happy in your praise that he'll even step himself down into a fiery furnace and he'll stand there just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did and he He will stand there with you in the fiery furnace. And when you give him praise, glory to God, he'll shake that fire completely out. Hallelujah. This is the God that gets happy when you praise him. He will go to a jail. He will go to a a fiery execution. He will show up and set an ambush upon our enemy if we praise him. You say, well, pastor, we praise him every week. (laughs) Do we? Do we? Do we, really? Here's a target. Let's praise him until the building shakes. Now, now wait. It happened in the word. Why can it not happen right now? Praise him until God just gets happy. Praise him is not to release a sound. It's not to release a song. It's to touch the heart of God until he gets happy. And when he gets happy, (laughs) you get God's attention. You hear what I'm saying? Praise gets God's attention. Habakkuk said his splendor and majesty covers the earth and the whole earth, excuse me, covers the heavens and the whole earth is full of his praise. Praise gets God's attention. You can be demon-possessed like the man of Gadara, but the moment praise hits this atmosphere, devils go. It's like turning on a light and cockroaches scatter. And yes, I equate devils to cockroaches. That and flies and dunghills. 
That's their only domain. But just like the Gadarene, when praise hits the atmosphere, they're suddenly you put in the right mind. An issue of blood will stop when our praise touches the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. <laughs> our praise cannot offer to God a dead hallelujah. God won't receive a dead hallelujah. God won't receive from you and me a dead hallelujah. You understand what I'm saying? We'll try to offer up some lip service. God says, mm, I don't want that stuff. Don't give that to me. I will, when, ah, when you praise me, child, I'll give you everything that you desire. Praise is delighting yourself into God. And he said in Psalm 37 that when we delight ourselves in the Lord, he gives us the desires of our heart. Tell the person next to you, praise gets his attention. Can I keep going? Are you ready to go? Number three, there is a story in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 about Jehoshaphat. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to, I'm going to pick up at verse 24. And it says, as Judah came up over the rise, looking into the wilderness of the horde of the barbarians, they looked on a, on a killing field of dead bodies, not a living soul among them. <laughs> and when Jehoshaphat and his people came to carry off the plunder, they found more loot than they could carry off. Equipment, clothing, valuables. It took three days just to cart the spoils away. On the fourth day, they came together at the Valley of Barak, which means the Valley of Blessing. And they blessed God. Here is a story of where God says, look, send in the praisers. Send in the singers. Send in those that will praise me and worship me. And suddenly God sweeps over the battlefield and literally wipes out the entire army. And, and then, look, now that now all of God's people were going there to fight. God said, you're not coming here to fight. Praise me. You're just coming here to pick up the blessings. Amen. Have you ever had to praise yourself like a crank just to get your hands lifted up because you're just so weary? You know, it's like, man, God, you know the trouble I've been. I'm too, I'm too weary to fight. There is no fight when you praise God. Praise God. And you may find, look, I've learned this a hard way. Every time the devil tries to keep you out of church because he's got something for you. Right. Every time. That's right. Every time your flesh says, you don't need to do that. Don't pray today. It's because God's got something for you. And your flesh is saying, Ooh, I don't want that. Or the enemy will drop something in your ears. Don't read the word today. You don't need it. It's boring. You're too busy. But when those, now here's a good tool to remember. Anytime the devil comes in that fashion, you got to know that it's a lie. That really God's got something really wonderful above the norm for you. You don't feel like praising him? Praise him and see what happens. You don't, don't like feeling, you don't feel like going to church? Go to church and see what happens. Don't, you don't feel like picking up your word? Pick up your word and watch what happens. God's got, God's got spoils, and you may just find yourself taking three days to go through all the blessing. Three days. In an atmosphere of praise, anything is possible. Healing glory saturates the atmosphere in an atmosphere of praise. More healings and more miracles take place in an atmosphere of praise than a healing line. Mm -hmm. because why real praise God says I inhabit I consume the good and the bad the clean the unclean I'll take everything at that moment nothing remaining and then we wonder why you know I, I've known people that get teeth they get cavities filled during praise think of that you don't have to sit there in a chair and have a dentist grind on your teeth I've met people seriously that get their cavities filled in an atmosphere of praise I remember a testimony a woman gave one time. She said, man, I, I guess she was in an accident and it crushed her foot. She was in a, uh, in a, in a cast and on crutches. 
Now check this out. She said, God, the whole time, she said, I, I keep feeling this praise begin to flow out of me. And it was unusual. It wasn't just me, you know, singing songs. She had to sit down during praise because she couldn't put any pressure on her foot. She said, God began to invade the atmosphere. And she said, it was like pressure building. She said, finally, I just stood up and I just, man, had the, had the, had the pressure on my leg that was good. And, and there's what happened. She said, man, all of a sudden, I just took one step on my cast. And she said, the pain just. She said, I felt two hands on my foot adjusting bones. She said, have you ever saw a man or a woman dance with a cast on? It's crazy looking, but God healed her, set her bones back in place in an atmosphere of praise. Dear brother was in a hospital with stage four, had, had the, the worst kind of prostate cancer. And the next morning was set to go through or go to chemotherapy. He said, I sat in there and he said, it was boring watching the prices right on TV and all the garbage that they play. He said, so I just put on some praise music. And he said, after a few hours of that, he said, I was so saturated with the glory of God that I had the nurse. I said, when the doctor comes in for prep, I want to talk to him. Doctor comes in and says, look, can you do me a favor and run an x-ray before I go through chemo? He said, I don't want to go through that stuff if it's unnecessary. And he said, I believe God healed me. And the doctor just, yeah, right. But he argued with him, said, I'm not going to go through chemo unless I get another x-ray. Next morning, instead of chemo, they did an x-ray and doctor said, go home. There's no prostate cancer. Go home without one treatment of chemotherapy. Praise set an ambush on cancer. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. And let me give you the, the fourth one. Praise exalts the I am. Look, the devil is no match for God. You know that, right? No comparison. Nothing the devil will ever say or do will elevate him to the status of being like God. We know that. But did you know he tried? In the book of Isaiah, he listed out five I am's. The devil did. Not that he was, he was as bad as he is. He got religious. He, he got pious and decided to say I am just like God. Five times. Five times in the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, this is what he said. God said, but you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And I will make myself like the most high God. The devil got so stupid that he attached the I am to his own pride. And guess what? God says, mm -mm. there's only one I am, pal. And this is what he tells the devil. He said, yeah, you said you're I am, but here's what you really are. He said, you're not going up, you're going down. He said, I'm reducing you down to Sheol, to the remote recesses of the pit of the dead. And those that will see you will gaze at you and they will consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? God said, there's only one I am. Hallelujah. And he said, I am that I am. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. See, we are inhabited by the I am. Do you get that this morning? It is through praise that heaven comes down and that earth is touched with his divine glory. Here's the thing that you see. If you say, where do I get in return? I'm going to give you what you get in return. In praise, listen to me very carefully. This is what you can touch. This is what can touch you when you begin to offer God praise. Are you ready for this? I'm going to go quickly. Are you ready? He said, when you praise me, you see the I am. He said, I am Alpha and Omega. 
I'm from above. I am God Almighty. I'm holy. I'm the door. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the light of the world, the bread of life. I am the Lord and there is no other. I am the Lord who makes all things. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the vine, the way, the truth, and the life. I am your inheritance. I am your possession. I am your exceedingly great reward. I am your salvation. I am your shield. I am God and my glory thunders. I am the spirit of knowledge and understanding. I am the Holy Spirit that moved upon the deep. I am worthy of worship, glorious and incomparable. I am the giver of all revelation. I am glorious and full of weighty splendor. I am God who performs signs and wonders and miracles. I am the God who speaks in night seasons. I am the king of glory. I am he who searches the minds and the heart. I am the creator of all true worship. I am the Lord who strengthens out the heavens. I am Jehovah Rapha, your healer. I am the God who gives you dreams. I am the anointing oil. I am the bright cloud that comes to you. I am the living water of life. I am the Passover. Hallelujah. That's what he said. I am the conqueror of death, hell, and the grave. I am the supreme God, the deliverer and possessor. I am the Lord of hosts. I am the kingdom, the power, and the glory. I am God who cast out nations before you. I am the commander and chief of all heaven's armies. I am he who drives out the wicked before you. I am your strength. I am the lamb sitting on the throne. I am your victorious manner. I am the fullness of greatness, power, glory, victory, and majesty. I am the God almighty and infinite in strength. He said, I am your mighty shield. I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. I am the sword of the spirit. I am your high tower. I am your fortress. I am the ark of the covenant. I am the altar of the tabernacle. I am the balm of Gilead and the rose of Sharon. I am the tree of life and the lily of the valley. He said, I am the rock and there is no other. I am the glory and the cloud of the temple. I am the bread of life. I am your rock full of living water. I am the light of the world, the consuming fire, the bright and morning star. And I am God who restores your soul. I am the friend of sinners and I am the God of peace. I am great I am the manna which came down from heaven. I am the breath that gives you life. I am the beloved. I am God who strengthens out his hand. I am liberty and you see through the spirit. I am ever faithful. I am abundant in mercy. I am the altar of peace. I am the Lord who makes wise the simple. I am God who comforts you. I am the God of the poor and the stranger. I am the gentle and lowly in heart. I am the savior of both the Gentiles and the Jews. I am the battle standard. I am your battle cry. I am the Lord mighty in battle. I am the one who annihilates Satan's plans. I am the spirit of might. I am the master planner of all the nations and kingdoms. I am he who, lo- who leads you right in namesake. He said, I am your fortress. I am your high tower. I am great, and I am greatly to be praised. Glory to God. That is the God you serve. Tell me he is not worthy to be praised. Come on, somebody. What kind of God we serve that doesn't get us burning when we see that? Come on. That kind of fire will melt the frozen chosen. Come on now. Let's see when we get to heaven if we stand there and say, Oh, Lord. All of heaven erupts in the praises of God. Let me give you the last one. Praise opens up the goodness of God. Surely goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell forever in the house and in the presence of the Lord. Praise brings the goodness of God. There is supernatural power that releases into the natural when God's people praise him. I tell you what I see right now. There's a sword of the Lord in the atmosphere that God is wanting to release to somebody you've been battling and you haven't told a soul what your battle is. It's now you haven't even told a loved one that what you're dealing with inside. I don't know who that's for, but I'm telling you the sword of the Lord is here in the atmosphere for you to take. And God says, take the sword of the Lord and strike at that enemy with praise. And watch what I'll do. Hallelujah. That's for somebody. Glory to God. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. When the praises go up, the glory comes down. It's that simple. 
If we're going to see breakthrough in our personal lives, in our churches, in our cities, our regions, our nations, then we need to understand the subatonic power of praise. Praise, if it's praise, will transport us into the realm of the supernatural, into the power of God. And it releases a refreshing touch of God's presence and anointing. That's why he said, for in my presence is the fullness of joy. Ephesians 1.3 says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Praise ushers in his goodness. Whether you like it or not, whether you want it or not, his goodness is hunting you down. <laughs> and I can just see some of us running, looking back, I don't want that goodness. <laughs> I don't want that goodness. <laughs> but I can tell you, he ain't going to take it and give it to somebody else. He's got your name on it. And it's time that we as a family... It's been a hard year. How many of it's been a hard year for you? It's been a tough year. But the wonderful thing is, is even in the toughness, God has made me tough. God has strengthened when I was weak, when I was timid, when I wasn't willing to fight. And then when I fought, I fought like a fool. A wise soldier knows when to draw the sword and when to stay in the tent. I was an idiot and drew a sword out in the middle when God said, get in the tent. Messed everything up. Sometimes God says, look, you go in the tent. I've got this one. It's been a tough year. But it's time for his goodness. And don't argue with God. Don't try to challenge us. Say, look, I don't want it. I'm good enough. No, you not. None of us are that good. To say in, 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 in defiance, look, I don't want the goodness. You need it. We need it. I need it. And the sweet thing about the heart of God is that, look, I, I'm becoming more and more, I don't know if God has, has reshaped my thinking, but all I think about is his goodness, that he's a good God. And that he desires to, to pour out his goodness upon his people. What will make heaven attractive is the goodness of God. Which first starts in the manifestation of his son Jesus. Heaven, listen, eternity never attracted me. Jesus is what I was attracted to. You understand? In my attraction, my hunger for him, eternity was the benefit. And sometimes we just got to just say, all right, Lord, I, I'm, I'm not going to look. You know, look, I'm going I'm to close with this. I'm going to rattle you. Have you ever went to give somebody a gift and they argue with you? No, you didn't have to. You go to bless somebody. Well, you didn't have to. You shouldn't have. Try telling that to God. Oh, you shouldn't have sent your son. We didn't need him to die on the ground. You know how that would provoke God to know that you mean I gave up my only son for an ungrateful humanity? He would say, how dare you offend? Are you so deceived that you didn't even know without him you would have no future? Had, are you so deceived and arrogant on your way to hell that you can't thank me for sending my son? My only begotten son. You mean to tell me that the, the whippings and every drop of blood and the pain he endured and you're going to tell me you didn't have to do that, God? Can you imagine how re retarded that would be to, to get that arrogant, to say, we didn't need your son. You could have kept him. How dare we? The, here's the reason. 
Because if, if God wants to bless you, don't just say, God, you shouldn't have. Why? Did you, who am I to receive such goodness? You want to know why believers today don't receive the goodness of God? Because they don't feel they're worthy enough. When you have an unworthy identity, you reject every good thing that comes along, including friendships, relationships, spouses, giftings of God, anointings of God, ministries of God. Horrible place to be when you don't feel you're worthy of God's goodness. Every single one of you in here God found worthy. He found you worthy. And here's what I hear God saying, I'm not here just to meet your needs. What? I'm here to release abundant goodness to the point where you become drunken and saturated in my goodness. Did he not say in the word, taste and see that the Lord is good? When you sit at the table of God, are you going to say, I don't want the goodness of God. Give me a ham sandwich. I'll, I'll take a cracker. No worse, I'll take a crumb. I'll put my nose down where the dogs go for the crumb. Or are we going to say, Lord, thank you for such goodness. The goodness of God is a wonderful witness to the earth that has not ever enjoyed the goodness of God. You, 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 if you begin to flow with his favor and you come across someone that has only known hardship, I, I promise you, they'll say, where did you get all that goodness? And now you've just walked on a road to salvation to that individual. Let me tell you about the goodness of God starts with his son. Or are we going to stand dressed in black with a long, miserable faces and only convey to the world a God who's a brutal, mean, tyrant dictator that does nothing but want to burn the earth up? I have a son he makes me mad sometimes. Not one time have I said, you know, I'd like to just burn you up. Not one time. Not one time. Have I ever said, you know what, I just need to whack you right now. Or worse, don't talk to me. You made me mad. Worst thing that we could ever say. The heart of the Father is to take care of his sons and daughters. He shows affection through his goodness. Always. He shows affection by touching your lives with his favor. You say, Pastor, does that mean I go out and get a new car? It has nothing to do with monetary anything. But his favor will bring so much goodness that you won't need to finance a car and put yourself in debt. You just pay cash for it. Yeah. You see? Goodness of God may make you a soul winner. We become real wealth then. That's real wealth. The goodness of God make you, may make you be able to put your head on your pillow at night without being tormented. Do you know what it's like to blame somebody that's hurt you and hold them in contempt? The goodness of God may take pain away that an ongoing illness has created. The goodness of God means that you can sit down in the presence of your enemies. 